All right, so yeah, I'm going to uh, basically talk about, as Dr. Bashir said, uh, detection of microRNA and proteins using silicon nanowire biosensors. And so I just wanted to go through some slides real briefly about you know different cancer biomarkers and what we're trying to look for and what other um, uh, universities and uh, clinical settings are also trying to look for. And so it's you know a typical environment. You have the host, the tumor microenvironment, and cancerous cells. And there's basically two main ways that people are trying to understand cancer, understand the biomarkers, and be able to diagnose and create treatments. And one of them comes through high throughput sequencing, such as using a uh, Lumina system or the uh, other electronic detection methods in development right now, like ion torrent, to look at DNA and RNA sequences and look up for the genes and the proteins expressed from these. And the other part is using biosensor-based platforms or point of care systems, which look for not only RNA, but other altered levels of protein expressions, different uh, outside markers for immune cell profiles, and also metabolites from cancerous cells. And so just talking about the point of care diagnostics and why people are starting to look into these a lot more is that there's a lot less, uh, should I say, a lot more decentralization of testing. So you can get out of the core testing facility and monitor your treatment at home or in a doctor's office a lot easier. And you know, reduce the time of result and reduce the labor costs. And second is increasing the sensitivity. If you're able to uh, increase sensitivity and have a smaller device as well, you might be able to catch tumors in what they call malignancy or metastasis in an infant stage uh, where it's going to be much easier to treat. So this is just one of the DNA sequencers that's based upon electronic detection, which is the main basis for my talk, is using electronic methods for um, doing protein-based detection and RNA and DNA detection. So this is ion torrent. It's uh, electronic sequencing biochip, just as an example. And basically, this is what it looks like um, right here, where they have a bead and they attach DNA to it. And each time that a base is added through polymerase, it generates a response on this metal oxide sensitive layer here. Um, and you can just see that the difference is this is essentially the area where this bead goes. And this is what a M1 to M8 process for an Intel 32 nanometer node flow looks like. You can see the incredible similarities. And so right now, they're able to get maybe 1.5 million sensors per chip on here. Um, and this is what uh, they're actually trying to market now also to the clinical setting. And that's what one of the chips looks like. And so this is you know, what the end goal is, to be able to detect not only proteins and RNA through this method, but not only through pH, but also microRNA and proteins through their intrinsic charge. And just this is basically our basic platform is ISFETs or ion sensitive field effect transistors or biosensors. And so basically the equations for a typical MOSFET and an ISFET are essentially the same except for this metal is now replaced with a reference electrode and a salt solution. And so what happens is you have an active area made functional by mobilizing probes um, or uh, antibodies and the target molecules have a net change and what will happen is when a charged molecule binds to the surface, it alters the charge density and the effect of surface potential, and you get a shift in the device's response. And so you get a change in the threshold voltage and an electronic-based uh, detection event. And so right now, people have been trying to use CMOS-compatible nanowires or very uh, small width uh, devices because they're about the same size as probe molecules and targets, so you get a better response than off of a planar device itself. And so they've been able to uh, use CMOS compatible nanowires here for detection of antibodies, cancer biomarkers, DNA, and even monitoring kinetics. And so, but what is needed to create this to an actual marketable end is understanding better the nanowire operation, including the fabrication and stability, um, and also its surface functionalization response. And also because for fluorescent methods, such as ELISA's, um, there's been very standard protocols for immunohistochemistry that have developed, but yet with nanowires, it's actually um, in a, you know, an infant stage, and so a lot of protocols do need to be developed uh, that people can work off of um, and standardize. And so one of the main things of my talk is doing the copper characterization of the nanowires and being able to um, you know, digress that knowledge to other groups as well to be able to um, improve the enhancement and the sensitivity of the devices. And so one of the main things we came across was functionalizing the surfaces. 
Now a lot of molecules like Aptis here contain three functional groups which lead to polymeric layers. And when you're dealing with an electronic device that's interface sensitive and you want to get as close as possible to the interface, this is detrimental to uh, your sensitivity. And so what we did is we came up with a vapor-based deposition method that uses a silane, but it only has one functional linker here. So it can either only form a dimer with itself or react with the surface, which we were able to um, achieve actual true uniform uh, high density layers that were only one monolayer thick. And just conjugation to these devices using either an epoxy moiety or an amino moiety, you can use NHS esters, isothiocyanates, or amine groups, and we all get very high density levels. And because um, it's only 15 minutes, we actually characterize this in detail and find that um, you do get almost a 95% coverage um, uh, due to looking at XPS density of uh, atomic elements. And so this actually is being used in other current technology and other groups right now to um, make reference sensors. So they block out all these groups instead with a chain that's pH insensitive. Um, and they're actually able to get less than a millivolt per pH response when they deposit this as opposed to the maximum sensitivity. So it does a very good job of actually blocking these sites. And so the other part is that we're trying to um, deal with the biointerfacing and the fabrication dependence on the sensitivity. And so this is just what some of our nanowires here of width 100 nanometers and some of the nano plates. And so these also have an ultra thin thickness of maybe 30 nanometers, which allows it to be a fully depleted device and give us the best sensitivity. And so our study was to generate protocols for creating stable nanowires and functionalizing the surface for protein-based sensing. And also understanding the effect of the different uh, variables like thickness and linker chemistry. And so we took that vapor-based method and we tried to functionalize the surface and optimize it with different um, functional groups here, such as this small linker here, this one that has a peg, and then typical glutaraldehyde. Because usually the farther away you get it from the interface with an electronic-based device, the lower your sensitivity is. But what we found is that when we did the fluorescent measurements on this, um, we find that this smaller linker actually provides the best um, and the highest density, but gives us less signal to noise ratio than this pegylated one, which has, I guess, a better passivation. And so this was the first step into optimizing and, and getting a better device for sensing is using this chemistry. And so next we just looked into primary antibody concentrations and using a standard ELISA-based protocol for depositing primary antibodies. So we found that if we go to 100 nanograms per ml, this is a change in that threshold voltage I was talking about plotted versus that concentration. And so we can see that when you go over 100 nanograms per ml, you essentially saturate out the surface. And you can see that with these different linkers that the DSC one, which gave the highest fluorescence, also gave the highest change in the threshold voltage. And this also follows through the fluorescent images of the nanowire areas here. And so we can just see that nonspecific binding with BSPEG, with all of these different uh, moieties, rabbit IgG, mouse IgG, uh, mouse IgA, uh, what we get is we get specificities over 20 to 1 versus similar IgGs and uh, isotypes of immunoglobulins with uh, the BSPEG-based chemistry. And so here we can see just by looking at the gate oxide thickness of the device from 50 angstroms to 90 to 150, um, we find that looking at the current versus voltage curves that we get, you know, as expected with a thicker oxide thickness, a worse subthreshold slope going from about 290 to 390 millivolts per decade, which is something that we decided to change in the next generation of devices. But you can see here that we're able to begin limits of detection of actual mouse IgGs to between 0.1 and 1 picogram per ml, at least, um, using a standard silicon oxide, thermal oxide based process. But some of the issues that we did come across was, even though we have a thick oxide, the subthreshold slope indeed would be poor and we would get a lot of drift due to mobile charges and interface traps. But then when you go to a thinner oxide, we would get very bad leakage. Um, and so basically the way that we wanted to get around this was by then using high K dielectrics because we can increase the, uh, the thickness of the layer while maintaining a very high capacitance still. And so we decided to start using hafnium oxide um, as our high K dielectric. And we used a 15 nanometer thick 
HFO2 ALD, atomic layer uh, deposited, with an equivalent oxide thickness of about 3.2 nanometers, which we did certain anneals and understood the annealing uh, parameters with forming gases and others to optimize the process to get uh, very high um, reproducibility, low drift, and low hysteresis. And so basically we use this AG, AGCL reference electrode and do the same thing as we did before and monitor the threshold voltage. And as you saw before, it was maybe 290 to 390 millivolts per decade with the thermal oxide, but with a half the oxide based system, we get a sub-threshold slope of 112 millivolts per decade with a change in the threshold voltage of maybe 2.7 millivolts. Um, so we have a very good device performance in fluid with much better parameters than what you would have with a thermal oxide device alone. Um, and so we're able to maintain that low heat leakage while having a high subthreshold slope and a low drift with a hafnium oxide system. And so with hafnium oxide, we actually functionalized with um, polyolysine because we found that even though the SiO2 amino-based uh, vapor deposition, you couldn't reuse the devices as well than if you used an actual electrostatically absorbed layer like this. And so we characterized um, this poly L lysine layer that we put down with uh, two different molecular weights, 9 to 14 K and 70 to 150,000 molecular weights, and found that we got actual thicknesses of about one nanometer for each one but you can see that the roughness and the uniformity is less on the higher molecular weight system. And so we used a lower molecular weight system here uh, to, and these are actually AFM measurements where we scratched the surface and then measured the thickness afterwards. And so we put down probe molecules and blocked it accordingly with standard uh, based microarray protocols. And so we looked at a matched target here of microRNA-10B versus a mismatch target of microRNA-21 for a nanowire and those wider nanoplate devices. And what we found is that we were able to get limits of detection down to 1 to 10 femtomolar with that low molecular weight poly L lysine. And a, you can see that all the way through almost seven orders of magnitude, we get minimal binding of the mismatch target. And so our work in progress, um, as uh, Dr. Bashir talked about, we are now actually partnering with uh, Taiwan Semiconductor to create extended gate FETs um, with dielectrics, uh, including hafnium oxide, and there is a titanium nitride layer here. So right now we're currently testing a 0.3 micron CMOS process, um, and also some other uh, processes in imaging sensors uh, for biological applications. And we're using lots of different width to length ratios and trying these uh, experiments right now uh, in real time with microRNA as well as proteins. So I try to get through all of those reasonably <laughs> quickly. And I thank you guys for coming. And uh, any questions or comments? Questions? <laughs> oh, right now at, at Dow, I don't know yet, but it's uh, the same one as this at Gmail right now. <laughs> so, Brian, I have a question. Sure. So, how is this system like this? Because we this data. Yeah, so um, what we found was that uh, using a more hydrophobic blocking agent, we were able to get um, better specificity than if we had something that was uh, more hydrophilic. Um, and also, I think using stuff that was more negatively charged, we got better specificities than if we used um, agents that were more positively charged. Um, and also, with that pegylated linker right there, I feel that the peg layer that was there was why we got the, the best specificities um, compared to the others. Is that just because of the lower? Uh density, so we'll have less charging actions. Yeah, and also um, I think that when you put down that peg linker, if any of it hydrolyzes, you have a peg layer which is inert. Mm -hmm. And so the nonspecific binding is much lower than other unreacted sites. Any other questions? Okay, no questions. Let's send all speakers one more time.